evening. Um, welcome to the uh, Global Consortium webinar. I am Wolf Kirsten. I'm with uh, International Health Consulting here in Berlin, Germany, and I'm your moderator today. Uh, this is our third uh, Global Consortium uh, meeting or webinar of, uh, of this year. We've been doing it for a couple of years now. And I think most of you know that the um, Global Consortium is a, a global thought leadership forum and to assist organizations that are looking to improve the health and to enhance performance of their employees uh, worldwide from a competitive advantage. So today's uh, focus is really the, the impact of work-related stress, psychological well-being, on employee health, and also on the company, uh, you know, business and company bottom line, and uh, how to actually create a psychologically healthy company. Um, before we get into that, I just want to get one of the uh, important reminder that the fourth annual global survey on health promotion and workplace wellness strategies is actually closing in a couple of days on the 15th. And I know that a lot of you have heard about it, and I hope you've participated and filled out the, the survey. We're really trying to make this as global as possible and extend our reach uh, each year. So it closes on July 15th, and uh, you can access it at uh, sparksurveys.com. So now to our feature topic. Um, as you know, work-related stress and psychosocial risk factors have been in the spotlight globally for, for a number of years now, and especially in Europe. Um, but 79% of managers are concerned about work-related stress, but only less than a third of companies have actually uh, procedures in place to deal with them. Um, this is according to the most recent European survey of enterprises on new and emerging risks. And that includes all kinds of risks, but, but especially psychosocial risks, because this is a newer risk. Uh, this survey, I recommend looking at it, uh, taking a look at that. It's, it's uh, based on 36,000 telephone interviews, so a fairly large um, sample, all kinds of different uh, enterprises uh, across Europe. Um, furthermore, the, the 1990, uh, 1989 EU framework directive states that employers have a duty to ensure the safety and health of workers in every aspect related to work. Uh, and this includes psychosocial risk factors. Now, um, as the EU works, some countries take this more seriously than others. <laughs> and it's interesting because now uh, in Italy and Spain, some very recent national legislation has been passed uh, with specific deadlines for compliance, uh, which ha actually has have, uh, had an interesting impact with some employees scurrying to, to comply, and, uh, you know, there's still a, a lot of confusion out there, but it's interesting that these uh, countries are taking it uh, very, very seriously with national legislation. Uh, and then, in addition, a European tax for mental health and well-being has passed, and a framework developed for mental health and workplace settings. So there's a lot of activity going on. And I think we have a, an excellent lineup of speakers today to, to shed some light here on this issue and uh, present a really interesting um, approach to the logically healthy company. So let me introduce uh, our speakers. I'll introduce them all three at once, and then they'll go one after the other uh, without interruption. So our first speaker is uh, Carrie Cooper. And a lot of you will know Carrie from, you know, if, if you're familiar with, with the field, and have spent some time on, on the field of mental health psychological well-being. Gary Cooper is uh, director of Robinson Cooper. Uh, he is a distinguished professor of organizational psychology and health at Lancaster University Management School. The second uh, speaker will be Ivan Robertson, also director of Robinson Cooper. And uh, Ivan is a professor of organizational psychology at Leeds University Business School in the UK. Our third featured speaker will be Tony Massey, who is the medical director uh, for VLife and he's board certified in addiction medicine and psychiatry, and he has 20 years, over 20 years of experience with health and wellness. Uh, just a reminder, I would like you to ask to hold your questions after, until the uh, presenters are spoken. Unless you have really pressing clarification questions, please type them in uh, in the Web, WebEx interface. So let's go, get started, Carrie. Uh, please go ahead. Oh, thank you very much, Will. Will. Uh, I guess you all know, I mean, we're really in the era of stress now. You know, that's the black plague of the 21st century. So workplace stress and well-being is high on everybody's agenda. If you listen to, uh, I was at Davos in January where uh, Sarkozy was, and he was talking about gross national well-being. We have a number of nation states. The World Economic Forum itself has a chronic disease and well-being um, 
kind of global agenda council, they're looking at nation states and organizations, what they can do, how they can improve the health and well being of people in the workplace. In the UK the government had the UK government had through their uh, government office for science a mental capital and well being project for two years, which I was a lead scientist on, and we had four hundred scientists around the globe. Uh, providing us with science reviews and then developing policy and then doing cost-benefit analysis of each policy and how we can improve health and well-being among children, old age, and particularly as well in the workplace, which was I, which was what uh, I was interested in. Now, what we thought we'd do, Ivan and I, is I would start off by showing you some of the costs of, of lack of workplace well-being. In other words, looking at, at, at stress levels, what it's costing us. And then take a look at what the science is. I think we have a lot of science in this area already. I think we know in the workplace the various factors that cause people to get ill. If you take a look at the ISR surveys, which are done every five years in, in Europe of about 11 million workers, you can see in many countries there's been a major decline in employee satisfaction levels. Um, the UK is doing remarkably well. I think we're tied with Italy third from the bottom of all the European countries. So employee satisfaction is not exactly high on, and, and given all the changes that are taking place in, in European companies and Europe generally, we've seen a decline in employee well-being and uh, higher stress levels than ever before. Uh, in the UK, I'm sorry, the numbers are wrong here, it's not 2009, it was in 2004, was the first year in which the Chartered Institute of Personnel Development, that's the HR directors in the UK, the, the, the major body, professional association uh, of HR people. For the first time in 2004, they found that stress was the leading cause of sickness absence. Because before that, it used to be muscular skeletal diseases like backache and pain and all that kind of stuff. But now stress and mental ill health, you combine the two, they represent almost two out of every three for a form of sickness absence. So if you go throughout Europe, you look at the EU reports too, again, stress is now the leading cause. Uh, it's not only the leading cause, but people are off longer with stress than they are with a physical uh, disability. So it's become a, a, a quite a big, important area. And it's in every sector. If you look at the uh, CIPD figures, it's in the public, the private sector, nonprofit, it's everywhere. Uh, so, and it's on the increase everywhere. So we, we, do, have a, we do have a problem here. Um, one of the big insurers that goes across Europe, the North Union, did a survey in the middle of 2006. Again, you can see stress, again, was a leading cause of sickness absence. Uh, again, uh, from uh, an employer liability point of view, big, big problems, of course. We also have litigation, um, a workman's compensation claims of litigation. And now, if you look in the UK, quite a lot of the claim, winning claims of individual employees against their employers, roughly about 200,000 pounds. Uh, for a lost claim on a stress-related uh, stress uh, issue. So it, it's, a, it's a, a bottom line issue, too. Um, this was part of what the UK government did when it was checking out, trying to do put a cost to it. The Sainsbury Center for Mental Health, a group of economists, very leading UK economists, tried to take a look at what was um, stress-related sickness absence actually costing um, the UK economy. Now, here's what, something quite interesting. Absenteeism cost 8.4 billion pounds, uh, but presenteeism was double that. And these, um, and presenteeism is a really growing problem, particularly in job insecure times like we're facing. If you look across the world now, I anticipate a massive decline in sickness absence rates in, in industry, not because we're doing a great job of managing it, I don't think we necessarily are, but what will happen is that people will be frightened of taking off and being, even if they're ill, they'll come to work uh, because of the job, in, the intrinsic job and security. And that was costed up by the group of economists at Sainsbury Center, which is one of the European's leading centers on mental well-being in Europe. And they costed it up by lack of added value to products and services of people turning up to work who are ill, who are turning up to work who are not physically ill, but psychologically stressed and not giving added value to the products and services. And that's quite a horrendous cost because quite a lot of these people also damage products and services when they turn up, even though either they should be home or they're suffering from stress and should be treated in some form or another. So we have to, I think, seriously worry about presenteeism and not just focus on absenteeism about, as a problem, as an outcome measure in, in the field of stress and well-being. Now, 
What do we know about it? Uh, we know that there's nothing wrong with pressure, pressure stimulating and motivating, but when pressure exceeds your ability to cope, then you're in the stress arena. So what we're all looking for, I guess, is the peak performance bit here. Uh, the red zone is where people are overstressed by whatever cause, and we'll get into that in a minute. If they're underutilized as well, they can suffer from boredom and not produce much added value either. So the optimal period is, is to get people performing under a bit of pressure, but not where pressure exceeds their ability to cope because that leads to maladaptive behavior in one form or another. Okay, so what does the science tell us? about what causes people problems in the workplace. Basically, it's quite a simple model. If you look at the factors on the left-hand side here, factors intrinsic to the job, the role you play in the organization, etc., and I'll go over each of these in, in a minute, they affect the individual. And then we get symptoms of it, which are either individual symptoms of people not coping with the pressures on the left in the workplace, or we get organizational symptoms, like in my company, Robertson Cooper, which is a university spin-off company. We get a lot of uh, major uh, clients coming to us saying that their problem is high sickness apps, high labor turnover, more accidents, uh, uh, stress being reported on the employee survey as a, as a, as a major problem, uh, bullying management style being a major problem. So most of the issues we see, of course, fall into the organizational box. And the model is a simple model. If you don't deal with some of the original causes on the left, it will lead to disease, either individual disease or organizational disease, prolonged strikes, and so on. The problem with the whole field of stress and well-being is if somebody's stressed, they can get ill in a different sort of way depending on their uh, biological or uh, genetic predisposition. So somebody may have a genetic predisposition for heart disease, or for some other illness, and stress becomes just the trigger mechanism for that illness to appear. So we don't all experience stress in the same way as an outcome measure, and that's difficult. Uh, therefore, it's difficult to just identify any one outcome uh, for it. And of course, uh, there's another box that should be on this uh, on this table, which is six foot long and goes six foot down. And if you don't deal with the original causes, of course, unfortunately, that's the box you go in. Um, and so, really, I think our job as occupational organization health psychologists is really to identify in the work environment what are the factors that cause people to get ill. Let's go back to the original boxes on the left-hand side. Factors intrinsic to the job. Well, every job is different. I mean, I've done studies in over 80 organizations across the world, probably on about 80 to 100,000 people. I don't even know how many. From pilots to bomb disposal officers in Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland. Uh, to teachers, to dentists, uh, you name it. And obviously, uh, work overload can be a problem, but also work underload. And we're finding that actually in this recession, people who don't feel they're fully utilized, who cannot, don't have enough to do, feel very, very vulnerable and are suffering from stress from not actually having enough to do. And I would recommend, by the way, to all of you, if you're in HR or occupational health, you should read uh, Joseph Heller's Something Happened, a wonderful fiction book. But and it's about a guy who's having a stress breakdown in an insurance company. And it's quite a funny book, but I think it illustrates some of the issues. So, for example, one of the colleagues in it who's suffering from um, underload says the following. Middle manager, I am bored with my work very often now. Everything routine that comes in, I pass along to somebody else. This makes my boredom worse. It's a real problem to decide whether it's more boring to do something boring and to pass along everything boring to somebody else that had nothing to do at all. So you can see that underload can be just as much of a problem as overload, and in certain occupations we have actually found that. Uh, another factor is the role you play in your organization. Now, the evidence is quite clear globally on this, and I, we've all done a meta-analysis and things on it. Uh, the, more le the more you don't have control or autonomy over your job, the more likely you're going to get ill. The evidence is quite clear-cut. So... That's, I think, why we have the engagement issue as a big HR issue, because people need to feel in control, need to have autonomy, and if they don't, if they feel they're micromanagers, they'll have negative consequences for their health. So role issues and having that kind of autonomy is quite critical. And here, here's a beauty, I think, coming from Heller. I only do a few of these Heller things, but I think they're really interesting. They kind of highlight it. 
and, and this is what uh, um, uh, another middle manager in his fiction book. Incidentally, Heller did work actually in insurance companies before he was catching 22, so it's quite interesting that he drew on his own experience. Middle manager says, what would happen if deliberately, calmly, with malice aforethought and obvious premeditation, I disobeyed? I know what would happen. Nothing. Nothing would happen, and the knowledge depresses me. I suppose it's just about impossible for someone like me to rebel anymore and produce any kind of lasting effect. I have lost the power to upset things that I had as a child. I can no longer change my environment or even disturb it seriously. They would simply fire it or get me as soon as I tried. So that's more or less an issue to do with kind of control. Very important part of it. Third one, relationships at work. Uh, obviously, relationships are important, and um, given that many businesses in the United States and Western Europe are service businesses now, as many of the manufacturing businesses have gone to the Far East, so we're service um, um, and knowledge-based businesses, uh, and relationships are quite critical. We could, in fact, given new technology, most of us work from home almost exclusively. You know, why do we come into an office? We come into an office because we want to be with other people because they meet various needs of ours. What the science tends to show is the thing that's the most damaging in the workplace. In different occupations, obviously, it's different. It could be colleagues, it could be clients, and, and whatever. But what seems to go across almost all occupations is the boss. Manager, management style seems to be a very critical um, causing factor, causal factor in people getting ill. In fact, over the door, over the entrance way of almost any organization should be your boss is potentially dangerous to your health. Because actually, management style is fundamental. The more managers give people autonomy, the more they manage them by praise and reward, and less by fault finding, bullying, and bottom line management style, the healthier you're going to be, and the more productive. And the evidence is quite clear if you look at a lot of uh, studies and meta-analyses carried out, uh, mm -hmm. management style seems to be pretty fundamental. I'm just going to give you one last quote from Heller, and then I'll, I'll stop because it's my favorite. I don't get any royalties on the Heller book, incidentally. But uh, I just thought it would be nice. I love the opening paragraph of Heller's book, Something's Happened, which I think in, in, in highlights and emphasizes the importance of, you know, our relationships at work. Listen to what he says. It's comical, but it's also quite deep-rooted. In the office in which I work, there are five people of who I am afraid. Each of these five people is afraid of four people, excluding overlaps, for a total of 20. And each of these 20 is afraid of six people, making a total of 120 people who are feared by at least one person. In my department, there are six people who are afraid of, afraid of me, and one small secretary is afraid of all of us. I have one other person working for me who's not afraid of anyone, not even me, and I fire him quickly, but I'm afraid of him. Anyway, it goes on, and it's humorous, but it's also quite telling that, that uh, a fiction author who actually worked in a company should open his book with that kind of comment. So relationships are fundamental to people's health and well-being, but this, the most significant is the manager. And, what they do. and if you go to most business schools, and you ask any business school, I'm at one of the top 20 business schools in the world on our MBA program at Lancaster University Management School. You go to our school, you go to any business school in the United States, anywhere in the world, and you say to the deans of those business schools, how many courses do you have on training people in social and interpersonal skills? Actually, how people should be managed, rather than on economics, on marketing, on OB, on HR. How much skill base is there on an MBA program? You'll find it's almost nothing. And yet, that's what their job is really about. So it's quite fundamental. Another one, career development, quite an important one. Now we're seeing by career development, I mean, we used to worry during the growth times about people being overpromoted. Now we're just worried about job security. Big factor now, job insecurity is coming up on every indicator on global studies that I carry out as a real driver and fear, which worries me because the more job insecure people are, the more they suffer from presenteeism. The more we get presenteeism, the more we get a poor performance and potentially ill health down the line. Organization structure and climate, what kind of an organization are we? Are we an engaging organization, or do we just say we're engaging? Do we walk the talk, or do, in effect, uh, we do the typical HR blurb, you know, the most valuable resource we have is our, is our people, and actually don't walk the talk? 
So I think the structure and the climate of the organization, which is easily measurable, you know, Roberts and Cooper, we do stress audits all the time and well beyond. We can determine when organizations have problems. And we can determine all these kind of factors with a psychometric tool we have, which has data on over 100,000 people. And then the final one is work-life balance. I think this has become a real big issue now. If you look in most European countries now, two out of every three women are working, and the, in the majority of European countries, they're working full-time. And if you take a look at the UK, for example, we have the longest working hours in Europe, and this is causing enormous problems. So when employee surveys come out, one issue is, tends to come up high is stress and lack of well-being, but another one that comes in the top three or four is lack of work-life balance, and that's because work is spilling in over into family life. Luckily, we have in the UK a law which says that if you have kids under 16, you, as an employee, you have the right to request from your employer flexible working, right? And the new government is going to introduce legislation, I think, which says the right to request will be for everybody, not just people with kids. Very interesting indeed. You won't get that in the United States uh, and many other countries, but we need that. Anyway, that gives you, and I think just gives you a kind of brief overview of the cost of it, what the issues are, and now I'll hand over to Ivan Robertson, which is the kind of well-being agenda. Okay, thanks, Terry. Um, what I want to do is just pick up on some of the issues that Terry's been talking about and focus in particular to start with on the impact that psychological well-being has on individuals but also on organizational outcomes. The first slide here uh, is, is, is one of a number of studies that I could have picked out that actually indicates the link between levels of psychological well-being and a range of outcomes for individuals. Um, what this slide is framed is in terms of poor psychological well-being being linked to higher cardiovascular risk and the other problems that are on the other bullet points in that slide. What I'd like to do though is just turn this whole thing around and switch the focus to well if poor psychological well-being provides the risk factors, enhanced or good psychological well-being provides protection or benefit factors as well. Um, the illustrations on this slide are for biological markers that are linked to quite serious illnesses. Um, the next slide relates to um, something more serious than illness mortality itself. Um, and again, it's a, a range of studies that have been looked at, pulled together into a meta-analysis linking positive psychological well-being this time with reduced mortality, lower rates of mortality uh, from heart disease and also for people with other diseases it provides a protective effect. But it isn't only serious kinds of uh, physical health issues that psychological well-being is, is linked with for the individual. Um, here's a study that looked at relationships between uh, people's tendency to catch colds and psychological well-being. Now this study was actually a fully double-blind prospective study. In other words, people were randomly infected with the common cold virus. They were double-blinded to it, so they didn't know if they were being infected. The investigators didn't know who was being infected. At the end of the study, they measured physiologically whether people had caught colds or not. I think if you look at the results, they're really quite telling. The blue line, stretching up to almost 35%, it's for people with low well-being scores and almost twice as many people in that category uh, caught colds compared with the green line which is people in the positive well-being group. So from an individual point of view, apart from the obvious facts about their own psychological feelings of well-being as well, there's a range of impacts for the individual, some of which are quite serious from theirs on the organisation's point of view. But we can also see that psychological well-being is linked to a, a set of important outcomes that uh, are relevant and important from the organization's point of view. I'm not going to go through all the points on this slide in detail, it's quite a busy slide, but basically the point I'm making here is that there is a good set of studies that link 
the psychological well-being of people in organizations with important outcomes as far as the organizations are concerned, including obvious factors like sickness absence, but also productivity, customer satisfaction, employee turnover, and so on. Um, so, psychological well-being has two kinds of impacts, both on individuals and on organizations. One of the questions that strikes me when you look at this current slide is, okay, if you improve the psychological well-being of people in an organization, bear in mind here I'm talking about everyone in the organization, not just that small, relatively small group of people with mental health problems. I'm talking about improving the average overall psychological well-being of everyone in the organization. If you do that, you clearly are likely, and we've done some studies to demonstrate this, to get these kind of business benefits. Well, how does that work? Why is it that you get these kind of organizational benefits? I think this next slide, whoops, this skips one, I pressed the button too hard. Uh, wow, that shot lights at the end. Okay, I'm back where I wanted to be now. Um, this is, from, again, evidence from a range of different studies. And what it shows is that people who are higher on psychological well-being, they think, feel, and behave differently. And they behave in ways that are both helpful to them and their own individual success and well-being, but also helpful from the organization's point of view and feed in in a beneficial way to get the kind of benefits that I've been talking about. So, if we make the link between high levels of positive well-being, organizationally beneficial outcomes, next question is, well, okay, so what is it that improves or enhances the psychological well-being of individuals and organizations? Basically, that boils down to a set of key workplace factors. Um, there are three examples of such on the slide here. The middle one is the one that we use in our work with organizations. The one on the left is the UK's Health and Safety Executive. The one on the right is the Irish Health and Safety Authority. What you'll see is that all of these things revolve around similar kinds of issues. They're about the extent to which people are given control and autonomy over the work they do, the extent to which demands are made on them, reasonable demands or unreasonable demands, and the extent to which resources and support, either through relationships with others at work or other kinds of things, help to support them and help them uh, to fulfill their role. Now, Kerry was saying earlier on, there's nothing wrong with pressure at work. A certain amount of pressure is actually a good thing. If you haven't felt under pressure, then how can the achievement feel, feel really worthwhile? So, it's important to recognize that managing psychological well-being at work is not about removing pressure. It is about removing the wrong kind of pressure. So, basically, managing performance is about managing pressure, managing the organization. And again, as Terry said, a lot of this comes down to the role of the individual line manager. And it's about balancing up the demands made on individuals, the resources available to them, the levels of control that they have over their work to ensure that as much of the time as possible the pressure is positive and that they stay in that field of zone. Just to illustrate what I'm talking about when I say positive pressure, here are some examples of what I mean by challenge pressures, in other words, things that would be seen as positive pressures for individuals. There's nothing wrong with a heavy workload. When the workload turns into work overload, then it's a problem. Role ambiguity, difficult work relationships, job insecurity, really always, all of the time, are hindrance pressures and get in the way of people performing effectively. So, basic points I'm trying to make are that there's a set of key workplace factors. This is the diagram on the right hand side of the slide. Those workplace factors impact on positive psychological well-being and then you get the outcomes for both 
individuals and the organization. The other points on the right hand side of the slide, basically it's not difficult to measure levels of psychological well-being in the workplace. We do it all the time. It's linked to the outcomes that I've talked about and it's influenced by the two workplace factors, as I've said. Here's an overall model that really puts all of this stuff that both Terry and I have been talking about together. So you've got a set of key workplace factors which need to be managed most importantly by the immediate line manager, but also by the leadership of the organisation right across the board as well. Of course, one of the things they have to do is value psychological well-being of employees as well as performance and productivity. That generates the intervening variables which are psychological well-being, employee engagement as well, which produces the individual outcomes which in turn generates the organisation level outcomes. Just the final walk through the change process that can be involved, this is the kind of thing that uh, when we work with organisations we use. The first point is really important because an organisation really wants to recognise the business benefits of investing in employee psychological well-being. So what are the kind of targets that are being uh, aimed at here by the organisation? Is it to cut medical costs? Is it to improve attendance? Reduce presenteeism? Improve engagement? Customer satisfaction? Whatever it might be, it's important to start with those. Then the process, I think, more or less speaks for itself. Assess the current levels, disseminate those results. That sometimes is a difficult step for organisations to take, particularly if the results right across the board are not that healthy, which does happen clearly. Four, five and six are really the guts of the improvement process. And that's about providing managers with the results for their own unit, giving them some ownership of that, helping them, training them in how to run a feedback and an improvement process and then flowing through that improvement process with them. A snapshot of part of the kind of thing I'm talking about here is illustrated with this slide. So we have workshops to upskill the leaders and managers in how to interpret their particular scores for their unit, how to feed that back, and then to go into a process which has a number of feedback loops, maybe taking a 12 to 18 month time frame with their work group, working together with their work group to improve and or sustain or hold the position that they're in. Particularly true at the moment to sustain, I think, and hold because of the current economic climate and the additional pressures uh, that people are experiencing. In the that gets me to the end of uh, what I have to say. Tony, you want to uh, proceed? Uh, sure. Um, okay. And I think I have the control. We'll, we'll see. We'll, uh, if I'm not able to change slides, I may pass that back to you. What I wanted to talk about here, uh, it really is um, just flows right along with uh, what Kerry and Ivan have talked about. This is a, I would say, a virtuous cycle of uh, a, a healthy organization. And um, what uh, Kerry and, and Ivan have talked an awful lot about is that organizational support. And even though it's one item here, you can imagine it's, there's many, many factors involved in that and really a, a, a leadership strategy for a psychologically healthy organization is part of that organizational support. But if you have that organizational support, that can help drive healthy behaviors at an individual employee level. And I cited here uh, activities, physical activity, uh, good nutrition, um, uh, proper sleep, and positive uh, relationships. Now, I cited these four because there's actually a large body of research to support how these particular uh, factors uh, are related to a resilience to stress. Um, 
again, you know, it's well stated with uh, the evidence that uh, Carrie and Ivan have, have shown that you're not going to get rid of stress in organization. And, in fact, some stress is, is, is a very positive thing. When you have improved resilience to stress, that can sort of shift that stress performance curve. It shifts it to the right so that the peak performance uh, um, area is just much larger. People can handle a lot more stress. And when you have a, uh, an employee base that has uh, an improved resilience to stress, that can then drive uh, health. And I have psychological health, behavioral health, which would be, you know, more of a, um, you know, mental illness, that sort of thing, it's in behavioral health. And I should have put in here in, in medical health. Um, and certainly in the United States, uh, you know, medical health is, uh, is, you know, becoming very important for, uh, it is very important for organizations. And that's a real cost driver. You have improvements in those uh, factors, and you have improvements in productivity, uh, less absenteeism, and probably even more important than that, and, and, and uh, I would say this well, it's really uh, um, the uh, presenteeism that, uh, you know, it, it probably can come back to, to really deliver um, uh, either good results or, or disappointing results to organization. So you have improved productivity and then uh, decreased medical costs now, uh, where across the globe, medical costs may not be a huge factor for uh, organizations in the United States. Uh, medical costs are, are very important. Often medical costs exceed the cost of uh, the um, producing the goods that you're selling. You know, like the automobile industry, you know, to, in, to provide the medical insurance for an automobile worker costs more than it does to, you know, buy the steel and everything else that goes in a car. Um, let's see if I can move this slide down. Uh, okay. Very good. Um, now, looking again at this cost impact, because I think that um, organizations – uh, need to have a, um, a kind of a bottom line argument for developing any strategy. And uh, um, fortunately, there's an awful lot of research that supports the uh, real bottom line, the return on investment for uh, well-being in the, in the workplace and, and uh, really tackling stress in a, in a very positive way. Um, again, this is a bit U.S.-centric, but looking at medical cost, you know, not even paying attention to productivity, just the medical cost, if you um, improve the health, health risk of employees by really just 1%, you will break even on uh, a, a rather aggressive health promotion investment. And this is $282 uh, per employee for years, pretty significant um, investment. So it doesn't take much movement of the dial to just, just to break even. Um, and this speaks to the scope of the impact of well-being in, in business costs. In this case, again, it's just, just medical costs. You can sort of imagine that if you add in absenteeism, presenteeism, productivity, that you would, you know, it would be even less of a, um, a, you know, reduction of health risk would get you, get you that break-even point. Um, then if you, well, if we look at um, medical and productivity issues, um, on average, every pound euro or dollar you spend on health and wellness programs will return about six dollars in absenteeism and medical cost. Um, the Mill study looked just at presenteeism and absenteeism cost, uh, didn't address the medical cost and, and came up with about that number. The uh, Baker study 
study looked at medical cost and absenteeism and did not calculate in presenteeism. So actually, the return on investment may be uh, may exceed six to one if you factor everything in. Um, and uh, just another way to look at things. The next slide here. Um, look at the health risk assessment scores and the, and the return on investment. There, there are many ways to, to measure psychological well-being. Um, and, you know, a health risk assessment is uh, it's just one way it, it, it attaches a number to um, a, an individual and, on average, a, a, an employee pool. Um, and a well-validated HRA uh, can give you a pretty accurate sense of where, where you are as an organization and, and how you improve or, or get worse over time. So I just pulled uh, two uh, particular uh, um, studies. This is kind of, kind of how it runs, um, and uh, this is the company that D-Life has worked with. One uh, shows a 10% improvement in HRA score associated with uh, a little bit under a 2% improvement staff turnover and an absence reduction, you can see, of uh, uh, almost uh, about four and a half uh, days per employee per year. And, uh, I, you know, again, you can sort of do a calculation of numbers there. You can see that that adds up to real, um, you know, a really substantial amount of money uh, over time. Um, another, it's very similar, 10.1% improvement in HR days, uh, scores has this reduct associated with reduction in absence and a decrease in turnover. Um, you know, so these are uh, just numbers sort of indicate that a well-formed, well-executed uh, strategy for health and wellness really can deliver results that are meaningful to an organization. Um, you know, beyond just, just sort of, you know, doing the right thing and sort of feel good stuff, it just has a meaningful impact on, um, you know, the profits and, um, you know, the quality of uh, uh, service and uh, the product delivered to, to, you know, through these organizations. Um, that, that's pretty much it uh, for me, Wolf. Uh, I, I'll turn this back yep. over to you and I'll probably have some questions from the audience. Excellent. Thanks, thanks Tony. Thanks a lot for the uh, presentation and thanks to, to all three speakers. I, I think we can see that, you know, this uh, is not an issue uh, we can't afford to ignore it anymore, I think, and it comes up everywhere. And uh, and, and there are ways to address it. So I, I would like to, to, to open it up to, to everybody to, to ask questions, comments, uh, or share what you are doing in this area. It's always interesting, I think. Um, so, Barry, if you want to help me in terms of uh, seeing any questions, any, any hands raised so far? Certainly, no hands at the moment. So if anybody has a question, you can just click on the raise hand icon or tap your question into the Q&A session, or you can even put it in the chat console. Um, I, I mean, I can definitely kick it off here as I don't see any hands, but um, this, is, this is to carry an island. Um, in, in your experience, how, how common do you think an organizational approach is these days um, in terms of addressing, you know, demand and control, role clarification and these things? Is that, obviously, I think there's some growth, you know, but how, from, uh, from your perspective, how common is that uh, in, in the corporate world? I mean, I, I think what uh, what happens, Wolf, is this, is that I think there's very different approaches in different countries. So if you take a look at the U.S., I think they're much more individually orientated than, than perhaps Europe and the U.K. The U.K. is very much more into looking at what the organization can do about it. And I think that, I think if you, in a, in a collectivist culture, if you're in a group-orientated culture like the U.K. and many of the European countries, they tend to be more focused in on what the organization can do to help improve well-being and health. I think an individualistically more orientated size like the U.S., it, it's much more how, how can the organization 
set the framework for the individual to deal with it themselves. I think we need a bit of both. And my experience is that we're getting more and more companies here looking at the bottom line and saying, hey, this is costing us. This is real. It's costing us. And forget your sickness absence, people not doing added value to products and services, not contributing there. Uh, uh, you know, when our productivity is not what it could be. And I think the bottom line is now that organizations, particularly in Europe, are much more keen on trying to get the organization to identify what it is doing that is damaging people's health and well-being. Uh, less so on, on dealing with the, at the individual level, although they do have EAPs in Europe like they do in the U.S. and North America generally for people, you know, as a kind of social support system uh, if they have problems, for example, outside of work, which they need help with. Uh, but I, my, my view is it's, it's moving now, and it's moving because we have so much evidence of the bottom line now of how it's affecting work. And senior people in organizations are not interested in moralistic arguments about, you know, the most valuable resource you have is your human resource so treat it properly. They're interested in, hey, I, I, hate, I hate saying this, but they're interested in saying, in, in saying, well, guess what? This is actually costing us. And if we can get at some of these factors, maybe, if we can identify them and deal with them, you know, that, that's good bottom line behavior. Yeah, can, I, can I just add to that? Um, sure. I think the, in the UK in particular, that's really uh, what I'm best qualified to talk about. But there has been quite a lot of pressure on organisations, some of it direct, a lot of it indirect, from government level reports and various kinds of initiatives that have really built the business case and referenced some of the research that I talked about and, and a much wider set of research as well. And I do think that's that's made some difference and has shifted things forward a little. It really, the, a corporate approach really depends on a recognition of the benefits, particularly by the top level leaders of the organization. And I think there is still some way to go before, as Terry was saying, I think it, it's really got to be based on a business case for people, and, and rightly so, for people who lead organizations. Now, you will talk to people who will say, oh, sure, yeah, I believe and I'm committed to the well-being of my employees. But in practice, in many cases, when it comes down to actually committing resources to that and actually doing something about it, only the people who really recognize the benefits in the user sense will actually do that. That number is increasing. Some of their recognition is based on the evidence, and I think events like today to just get the message across. But often they have to actually, they don't get it from reading a book or listening to a, a webinar. It's about an experience inside their own organization that suddenly brings the light on. Um, and in addition to top management, I think the other key player here is the line manager. And line managers have an awful lot to do already. And it doesn't help, I think, add another task to them which is say, oh, as well as all the other things you have to do, you need to look after the well-being, the psychological well-being of your employees, the group that report to you, without giving them some tools and some skills that they can use to actually fulfill that goal. And I think there is quite a gap there. Again, as Terry was saying about, you know, what do business skills do to actually train managers in some of these things? At the moment, not very much. So there is a need to actually work with line managers at the front line and skill them up and give them some tools. Excellent. Th thanks for the for the comment. On the on the kind of other side, obviously the business impact is, is huge, huge importance. What what is your view on the regulatory approach? Because you know I, I, I prefaced it earlier in terms of some countries taking a more um, the active role in terms of legislation. Do, do you think that, and I'm, I'm encouraging all participants to chime in here because it would be interesting to hear what some employers are reacting to this in Europe. Um, what is your view on that? Do you think that's a, a, a correct way, a good way to go, or do you think it's too, too complex of an issue to actually regulate this? It would be interesting to hear anybody's feedback, but, but otherwise, uh, carry or Ivan? I think you provided the 
framework. If you look at the UK, we have, we have in the US, there's something called NIOSH, the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, right? And they have a, a major section within it about workplace stress and well-being, and they've really done fantastic work. They've been in Cincinnati, they've done really good things, I've worked with them for years. However, they don't have the regulatory framework that we have, for example, in the UK and many European countries. We have the Health and Safety Executive, who have guidelines on workplace stress. Those guidelines are evidence-based. It's a very similar to the kind of issues both I and I have talked about, which have said, and by setting the guidelines, it's not saying that all your companies have to behave this way. However, if a number of employees in the company complain to the HSC, to the Health and Safety Executive or Commission, about workplace stress, then they can come in and issue what is called an improvement order on that company on stress of work, like you might do if you had uh, a blue asbestos lying around your workplace in a manufacturing facility. So having possible regulation has made companies think about this issue because they're worried about having a, an improvement on this platform. And if they don't improve, by the way, in the end, they can be closed down. And we've had several improvement orders in the UK on various workplaces already. So, and you get it in other European countries too, and even the EU is considering how it's going to regulate this as an issue. I don't think you'll ever get it as a dual citizen, as an original American, but now UK as well. I think what you're going to find is you'll never get the regulation in the United States. Employers are too strong and would, and would go against it. But I think it does actually focus the mind in countries that have this regulation because employers get worried about either being sued by their individual employee because guidelines are there about what an effective uh, well-being program or stress management program should be uh, in, in an organization. Yeah. But also, they just, aside from being sued, they don't want to be closed down. You know, Kerry, uh, I'm going to um, agree with you, but maybe for a slightly different reason. I think the United States... Uh, is a different situation than uh, most other countries in the world. Uh, and, and we're not going to have the sort of um, uh, regulation and, and, uh, for stress in the workplace. However, um, the cost of stress in the workplace is uh, borne more by organizations than by government at large. Uh, these organizations also pay for medical costs of their employees and their employees' families. Uh, and in uh, other countries in the world, um, with a, 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 a good national health system, you, you don't have that full cost of stress borne by the in, employers and, and organizations. So, um, you know, I think in that situation, you really do need to have the, uh, a, a partnership of the two, the two uh, entities that are, you know, bearing the cost of stress, and that would be the government uh, through the health cost, you know, the health cost and organizations with productivity uh, um, impacts of, of stress. I think Tony's absolutely, I think you're absolutely right. I think the driver in the United States is the medical care cost of employees. That's a really big driver in the U.S. We don't have that because in most European countries, we have a national health service where the state actually pays for the damage that an organization does to an individual. So you're absolutely right that there are kind of different drivers that perhaps it doesn't, perhaps the bottom line is, is good enough driver in a company like General Motors or, you know, GEC or some other, you know, General Electric or whatever to uh, motivate them to actually want to do something to keep the cost down. There is an interesting development in, 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 in some European countries uh, that, you know, I've talked to some employers about this where they said, you know, they've tried for years, uh, at least, you know, the, the medical directors or HR staff to, to bring this issue of, you know, psychosocial well-being, psychological well-being to the forefront, you know, running their, their heads against the wall. And then, you know, now there's, there's some legislation coming up that they're, all of a sudden they're, they're they're asking, you know, they're kind of active about it. So I think that's a really interesting development. Obviously, that's not everywhere, but like I said earlier, there are some, some countries in Europe which where it's becoming more of a, 
uh, a key issue, you know, from a legislative point. So I thought it's good to be aware of it. But obviously the, the cost issue is a, I totally agree, huge motivator and, and, and uh, incentive to, to address this. I know we're getting close here, so uh, is there any, any comments, any questions? Because so far I can't see any. Barry, do uh, you see any here, or I don't think so? No, there's no raised hands. There's no questions being asked in the chat console either. Okay. Um, well, I think uh, any, any closing comments from the speakers? Or? No, I mean, I think this is, you know, a big issue for all of us now, particularly given the credit crunch and the recession. I think the big issue now is, you know, uh, more f with less, and more with less means there's going to be more heavy workload on fewer people in the work environment because we're going to have to keep our labor costs down in the developed world uh, and the developing world as well, and that this is going to be more of a problem. And particularly what I've been and I have been emphasizing is the, li the role of the line manager. If we don't have really adept socially skilled line managers, we're going to have a bigger problem in the future. Yeah, I think just, just for me, when, when are you see the main benefit or cost as reduction in medical costs or improved productivity or whatever it is? In both cases, I think it's becoming more important rather than less because of the background situation that we're all facing. Um, and I, I think it's just um, something that it's going to stay on the agenda. And for both of those uh, goals, preventative action in the long run makes the best and the strongest business case for any organization, I think. I, I think there's going to be a Darwinian evolution of organizations. Um, and those who uh, organizations that are better able to maximize their productivity from their employees will ultimately uh, win more business and grow, and those that uh, stumble with this will, uh, will not grow and shrink or maybe go out of business. So um, this, it may take a bit of time for this to totally play out. Um, but uh, you know, you can you can see that an organization that is you know better able to you know do more with less will will ultimately uh, succeed. Excellent, and, and health plays such a key role as we all know. So, well, th special thanks to to all three speakers. Uh, I think you did a great job, and and of course, thank you to everybody to uh, uh, joining here. Very good. Um, just just briefly, our next uh, webinar will be at the the end of September. Uh, information will be set up shortly. So, um, and as always, please provide us with feedback if you can, uh, issues or topics or even regional uh, aspects. That would be very helpful for us. So, uh, well, okay, we'll have you a good uh, rest of your week, and thanks again for attending, and uh, talk to you next time. Thank you.